Dobrý večer. O tom, že každý člověk chce být krásný, jistě není pochyb. Otázka je, zda krása vždycky lidem usnadňuje život. To nevím. Například u interpretů vážné hudby je krása vždycky čímsi podezřelým. Divák a zejména kritik si není jistý, zda to, čím je uchvácen, je opravdu interpretačním mistrovství toho umělce, anebo to, jak umělec vypadá. Není divu, že třeba husloví virtuozové nevypadají vždycky jako filmové hvězdy. Třeba u takového Izáka Šterna, tam si mohl být člověk jistý, že to, čím je uchvácen, je opravdu jeho interpretační umění. Ale dnes vám představím na plovárně krásnou skotskou housistku s italskými kořeny, u které jsem si jistý, že by vás uchvátila, i kdybyste ji neviděli. Však by s ní také jinak německá společnost Deutsche Gramofon nepodepsala nahrávací smlouvu v hodnotě milionů liber a nezvali by ji ke spolupráci prestižní světové orchestry. Naším dnešním hostem na plovárně bude jedna z hvězd festivalu Dvořákova Praha, Housistka Nicola Benedetti. Miss Benedetti, you started to play a violin at the age of four? Yes, four. that's correct. I was trying to find out my memories of my age of four. And I guess I don't remember anything. You do remember the first contact with the instrument? Yeah, I think it's actually my, my first memory, other than some very small, silly memories that I have when I was very young. But I really remember not so much anything about the lesson, any specific things about the lesson. I just remember the feeling of being uh, scared, like really scared. scared. <laughs> But yeah, because I, I was quite shy and I would always, um, I'm left handed also. So I picked up the violin the wrong way, I like see. maybe 15 times and the teacher got quite frustrated with me because I continued to pick up the violin the wrong way. So the first lesson was terrible. but. And the second lesson, it was fine. It was good. I never thought about it, because w with violin, there is no left-handed holding, isn't it? No. Well, there the are guitar the players. Way. They do it in like they, tr yeah. traditional Scottish, Irish, American sort yeah. of traditional playing. Sometimes they occasionally they have left-handed yeah. play, but no. But you get used to it so quickly. What you do with the left hand is as difficult as what you do with the right hand. It's the same, really. So. Yeah. It didn't take long. <laughs> At the very beginning, it's usually uh, the job of the parents uh, to take care about the mm. kids when they practice. Mm. So, so um, who of your parents was uh, responsible for that? My mother. My mother. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, <laughs> How was she? <laughs> oh, she was amazing. I mean, my first sister's four years older than me yes. and we began playing on the same day at the same time she always believed anything that we would begin to do whether it was you know tennis or violin or mm. some ac activity uh, we had to take like very seriously and do very properly so we weren't really allowed to do 10 different things we really yeah. had to we, we, we chose the violin us, yeah. and she made us focus on the violin and you know she would often say If it's not something you want to do, you don't have to. But if you're going to do it, then do it properly. So she would really very much encourage us. Uh, Did she scream on you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have many <laughs> memories of that. But If she didn't, <laughs> she has to be a saint. Yeah. Because during practicing, especially on violin, I think it that's a taste, terrible. <laughs> test of nerves, really. I know. The first two years are painful. But uh, no, she... Um, I think, uh, of course, she was she was quite a strict mother, yeah. but she managed very well with me and my sister. I think it helped that actually I I very quickly loved to play. Mm. I wasn't trying to run away from the violin, yeah. and she was trying to push me towards. It wasn't like this kind of fighting at all. <laughs> well, at the very beginning, uh, to play any instruments uh, is uh, usually uh, not very exciting. It's usually mm. boring. And mm. then you come to a certain point mm. when it turns mm. and it starts to be exciting and amusing. What was the uh, point if in, in, in your career? Well, luckily, um, because of Suzuki method that I learned, um, you very quickly start playing melodies. So you're not just playing Achieves. open strings yeah, yeah. exercises. Yeah. You're yeah. immediately playing, you know, very simple, s silly, like not not serious melodies, but something that sounds like music. Like music. Yeah, 
and uh, so that makes the first few years a little less difficult <laughs> um, but I think um, there's some pieces that I, I started playing like um, Salud Amour by Elgar and Meditation by Massenet, mm. some very always slow, uh, very beautiful, very soulful pieces and I, I remember I was maybe seven, eight, something like that, playing these pieces and feeling suddenly very involved and very emotional right. about the piece, like even at such That's a good, yeah. young age. And I think that more than anything violinistic, I think it was something musical that really mm. was a very kind of memorable moment. Yeah. I couldn't imagine that a Scottish artist couldn't be influenced by the great tradition of Scottish fiddlers. Did you learn some Scottish reels or some of the Scottish music? Very little, um, because I think in Scotland all the teachers, um, violin teachers teaching classical, they have to fight so much to kind of separate the yeah. traditional methods and the traditional technique, which is so unbelievably different. I mean, is it the, so? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have quite a few friends, fiddle players. Yes. And we, it's like we don't play the same instrument, basically. I mean, it's so unbelievably different. They hold the instrument differently. They could you they, show it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, they probably wouldn't play with with, with this. Yeah. yeah. They choose different types of instruments, and rather than having like a posture, like yeah. proper posture and straight bow and and very kind of controlled sound, they they actually play like like this, like, like resting. This. It's very casual, <laughs> and and also I kind of hold my violin with with I, I rest it on yes. on here, and I kind of keep it up like this. Yeah. But they actually play. So my vibrato would be, and there would be like. It's a different kind of yeah. sound. So literally, it's a, a completely different technique, completely different way of holding the instrument. Yeah. And I think encouraged not, <laughs> not to do that, <laughs> which I'm grateful for because it wouldn't have been very useful playing Bruch concerto, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, is there uh, an example of Scottish folk music you could perform? Uh, yeah. Tiny pins? I, yeah, I can play like a, a slow Scottish air. I yeah. mean, the, the reels and the jigs, they're obviously amazing. But those specifically, you need um, even more different technique. Technique. Yeah, for. I can play, but it doesn't sound... No? <laughs> it doesn't sound um, this kind of authentic, rough, yeah. um, kind of like, you know, like people in a pub having fun. Yeah, yeah. You know, it yeah. sounds very correct. And <laughs> Do you want me to play? Yeah, this, sure, this surely. This is a piece... Um, yeah. I'll just play a small section, a piece um, called Mrs. Jameson's Favourite, yeah. and uh, the composer is unknown. Unknown. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> it's quite a treat to hear Scottish folk music being played on a two million pound yeah. worth Stradivari <laughs> instrument. It's the first time we have such a treasure in our <laughs> program. What do you think Antonio Stradivari uh, is saying now when he heard that? <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe he likes it, <laughs> the combination. <laughs> How did you get this instrument? In an extremely fortunate, lucky circumstance. Um, a man uh, in, who lives in London called Jonathan Moulds, he's 
president of Bank of America for Europe and Asia, yes. and quite a few violins like this. And uh, I really, as simple as this, got, I got a phone call from my management company saying that he had been in touch, he had heard a concert of mine, and he had this violin to offer if I wanted to play it. So That's I said, okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> no, no, of course, I went immediately and tried the violin. Can I, can I put it back? Oh, yeah. um, and actually, the first three, four months were just such a nightmare. I mean, really so difficult for me because I'd been playing before um, a very wonderful Italian instrument, but something that was a lot more simple, I guess, and, well, clearly. And uh, all my family and friends, they came to the concerts and um, when I began to play this instrument and they, everybody said afterwards, no, it's terrible, it's not working, you have to go back to your old really? violin because we can't hear you properly, the sound isn't projecting and all these things, yeah. Um, just because the violin is so complex and the character is very strong and I didn't have the, I guess, the, the knowledge yet of how to manipulate the violin properly so but I learned I mean I learned very quickly <laughs> but it took me really like two years I think to become comfortable with the violin. Do you think the audience can feel the difference or is it uh, more important for the musician that he has this feeling I have a Rolls Royce so mm. that I'm playing? Uh, I think um, after a certain level um, you know some Guaraninis or very good Guarneri instruments to the very top, to the very best Stradivarius, I don't think the audience can tell the difference because hear a soloist playing for maybe 30 minutes and what you hear is first of all the music and secondly the person and I don't think the mind really goes as far to try to hear the violin. I think the violin is like a, an expression of you and I think the, the audience really only, only hears you and your character and your sound. Um, but obviously if the violin is, is really not very good then um, the audience would be able to tell. Yeah. When you talked about the phrase, uh, how many mistakes uh, can be made in one single phrase? A lot of? Well, they're not mistakes really. No. I mean, mistakes are... If you play a wrong note, yeah, or, if you yeah, play yeah, a yeah, wrong yeah. note or something or terribly tone, yeah, in tune, tune or something like that. Yeah. But I think the key is always to um, to have some flexibility in your mind. I mean, you can spend a long time studying, and I think every musician should study. Should I example? Yeah, yeah. I would be happy <laughs> um, with that. Like uh, the beginning of Brook Concerto, which I'm playing. Yeah. If you're studying with your teacher you will build the phrase very, um, almost mathematically. Yeah. So you look at the direction in the score. There's a crescendo here and a diminuendo yes. here. So very sort of carefully. Um. Something like that that's very kind of makes sense, like you feel where it begins. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would be satisfied. <laughs> you feel where it begins yeah. and you feel the, the high point of the yes. phrase and then comes back down. Yeah. But the more you play and perform, the more you enjoy and you feel um, in every concert there are one million options of how you can you, how you can develop a phrase. Yeah. So actually I think, and also to play around with colour as well, colour a lot in, in phrases. I think if you have a preconception, it should you know, start here, go to here and come there. Um, you need that knowledge, but I think some sort of spontaneity and some sort of um, like inspiration in the moment um, means that there should never be a right and a wrong way yeah. to play something. Mm. There should always be many options, I think, in your, in your mind. So, so what, what kind of uh, other possibilities uh, do we have with this phrase? Okay. Which people um. start um, I mean there's so 
many, <laughs> so many different options. But the thing with classical music is the subtlety. It's really, it's really um, very small. Yeah. You know, small differences. Small differences. But I think that's why it's so important to be always open. Or like your mind has to be always open to to many different options because it has to be an expression of your breath and your mood and your how you feel physically, you know, there's so many things that have to be flexible, I think, for the sound and the emotion to be something natural and something true to that moment, something that's honestly you. Is it uh, so that uh, you can work on, a, uh, let's say, a concerto for a month, yeah. and uh, then, uh, before the concerto, you should forget everything and just play it with your heart because the knowledge is already there? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways of preparing yeah. for things. And again, over time, you you forget everything. You know, p people say, this is the way to prepare for a concerto. This is also the way yeah. to... And you forget all of these, and you find a way that works for you and only you. <laughs> and yeah, you have yeah. to develop that. That's right. But um, I think there is some truth in that, definitely, mm. because I think it's important that um, the piece becomes music again and with uh, concertos as difficult as the concertos written for violin um, it's very easy to become preoccupied and obsessed with with all the technical difficulties and working out the structure and understanding the phrase and understanding the orchestra and um, they're all details but what makes the music so wonderful mm. is the soul of the person that wrote the music yeah. So, you know, Beethoven's music is, is not just better because of his technical skill. It's better because of who he was. And That's right. I think eventually you have to go in a circle and come back yeah. to the most natural human part of mm. the music. Mm. And you can only do that from taking some distance away um, mm. from all the, the details of the piece. When you perform with uh, such an orchestra as, uh, let's say, Alasso, and you have um, another, how many, 30 violent players uh, behind your back? Yes. And uh, you have to prove I'm the soloist. Mm. That's not a, a, a <laughs> tough moment. I guess so, I guess so. Does it bring some tension if you if can feel all these uh, eyes uh, looking mm. at you and now show, show? Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah? I think the more your reputation grows, positive reputation grows, I think the easier that experience becomes. Um, but for me, like, I had a very, very difficult few years of that because I, after I won Young Musician of the Year, I had a lot of concerts. I mean, really, like, uh, far too many concerts, actually. And it was a very sort of sudden thing. It was very yeah. immediate. And um, so I was playing with many orchestras for the, for the first time, and it's when you're young as well and uh, and if you're even slightly sensitive type of person i mean a, a lot of soloists actually are incredibly um tough people and i have become more and more tough because you have to be yeah. um but actually um i've had many experiences of of really finding that process quite quite difficult <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. But over yeah. time, my playing is developing all the yeah. time, and my confidence is developing all you the time. You get the respect. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, with yeah. with that, um, providing you're making the right decisions and trying to do things that are right for you, then um, with that comes um, a kind of ease. So yeah. that whole situation, the introduction to an orchestra, is something I'm growing to really love to enjoy, mm. rather mm. than be scared of. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say you would have the possibility to meet Mozart or Sibelius mm. or one of these uh, genius. And you would have the chance to ask them to change a few bars in some of their concertos. Sibelius. Yeah? Third movement. <laughs> There's like four bars which yeah. are just very difficult. <laughs> I, I, would I guess we have to hear that. Oh my god, that's so horrible! <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. Those four bars. 
<laughs> That's so really mean. Zhang, you hear that? <laughs> Could you do, oh, do something with that? Oh yeah. dear, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is in your Prague program, which you are going to perform here, yeah. uh, some difficult plays that you have uh, to take care of? Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. there always are, but um, yeah. in Brook it's not so... Not yeah. so difficult like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Actually, I think it's one of those concertos a lot of violinists learn very young. Yeah. Um, so you, I, I learned uh, the second and third movements when I was eight, I think, and probably played them very badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's one of those concertos that you grow up thinking is like a young concerto. But actually, when you come to perform it, when you're older with orchestra and in professional circumstance, it's, I think, more difficult than people think. Yeah. But it's really so hugely popular but it should be i mean it's yeah. really amazing concerto well we're looking forward to hear that thank you thank you very much for sharing your time with us you're very welcome it was a thank delight to much. talk to you thank, thank you very much dnes byl naším hostem na plavárně nikola benedetti <laughs> oh no